Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Teacher Strategies for Distance Learning webinar series. Kabe is proud to present these series of special speakers who will be sharing effective practices to support English learners throughout California. I am Dr. Carmen Beck, and I hope you're in a safe space managing the circumstances due to COVID-19 and ready to join together with your Cabe Familia today. I am currently a, an adjunct professor in the Educational Leadership Department at Cal State San Bernardino. Today's webinar is being presented by our longtime friend, Professor of Whittier College, Dr. Ivania Soto, and she is backed by popular demand. We are very thankful that she's here. And today, our webinar is about using the FAIR model to explicitly teach academic vocabulary. As we get ready for today's exciting session, I have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speaker's microphones will be active and the participants will all be on mute. There will be interactive times in today's presentation, and we will use the chat box for you to enter your comments. If you would like to post a question during the presentation, please also use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen, and the chat window will pop up where you will be able to type in your questions or comments. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version so you can re-listen and share it with others. So now sit back, relax, and get ready for 30 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivania Soto. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you all uh, for being here this afternoon. Um, as Carmen suggested, this uh, presentation will be on the Freyer model and using the Freer model in particular with our English learners in order to explicitly teach academic vocabulary. And I will be sharing my screen. There will be portions of the presentation that will be interactive. So I will be having you all share in the chat box um, and I'll let you know, uh, I'll prompt you and let you know exactly what you'll be sharing. Uh, during those times. There'll be two parts to the presentation, an introduction to the research base and an introduction to the Freyer model strategy itself. And then I'll have a model lesson where I'll take you through each of the four steps in the four quadrants um, around the Freyer model. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, begin. We'll start with why the Freyer model, right? Um, and linguists, including Kate Kinsella, um, tell us that uh, academic English isn't natural language, right? Um, it's language that must be explicitly taught, especially for English learners who are uh, acquiring both academic English and the basics of English. And Kate Kinsella's definition um, of academic English is that it's not natural language. It has to be explicitly taught. And more importantly, that we're all academic English as a second language learners. Uh, we all need academic English. And, and a caveat to this, it's not to say that we're trying to take away an English learner's primary language, um, nor a variation of English. Instead, we want to build upon in an asset-based uh, way upon whatever language sets that our English learners bring to the table. And what Kate Kinsella tells us is that there are four essential components of academic English. The first one here listed here is the one we're going to unpack, which is academic vocabulary. And academic vocabulary is defined as tier two words or words or high utility words that go across content areas and tier three words, which are our domain specific or discipline specific words. Um, the a full diet of academic English would include syntax and grammar, sophisticated and, and complex and tactical grammatical structures, 
and the register of language. And last time we uh, unpacked the reciprocal, uh, reciprocal teaching, the strategy of reciprocal teaching, which addressed the register of language more closely. And so I, I'd like with that bit of introduction for you all in the chat box to, to let me know what, what strategies do you already use to teach academic vocabulary in particular? What's your go-to strategy? And, um, and so we'll, uh, we'll give you a, a minute or so to think through, right? What academic vocabulary strategies do you already use in the classroom setting uh, before I move forward with the Freer model? Okay, I'm seeing the CCD chart from Glad. Word walls, wonderful, yes. So cognate word walls are also really helpful. Um, the Freer model can be used as a sort of word wall, sentence frames, sentence starters, and I'm going to uh, show you how we can use the Freer model alongside of sentence frames. Um, I see some folks who already use the Freer model, which is wonderful, total physical response, the use of visuals, realia, kid-friendly language, um, graphic organizers, and these are all really helpful scaffolds, right, to use um, in particular with our English learners so that we are explicitly teaching mm -hmm. academic vocabulary um, in the classroom setting. And the main reason why I really like the Freyer model is that it helps students with unpacking many words as associated with a target word. And so uh, I, I noted earlier that with the Freyer model, we are going to unpack in particular from Beck and McEwen's work, tier two words, and our tier two words are high frequency words again, words that go across content areas, a word like analyze or summarize. Um, we also uh, use the Freyer model specifically with tier three words, which are our domain specific words. And um, the reason why I really like the Freyer model is because we're teaching many words as associated with the target word, which is the word in the center. So all of the words underneath the examples slash models box would be words that we are explicitly teaching alongside of the target word. In the middle here, you can see our target word, which we're gonna be unpacking today. Um, and that is the coronavirus, uh, right? Very relevant uh, for, for this time, right? Um, and this is a tier three word. We're going to unpack it, right, in sort of the, the science realm. Um, and so it's a tier three word. And you'll notice that there are four different quadrants to the Freyer model. Um, what I have done with each of the strategies that I'm outlining um, here in particular with the Freyer model, I have reoriented this strategy to create a scaffold for our English learners in particular. So what I've done is we're going counterclockwise note. We're not starting with the definition. The definition is the most cognitively and linguistically demanding of the four quadrants on the Freyer model. So instead, we're starting with the examples. Um, we then move to non-examples. Uh, we have a visual representation of the word, and then students come up with their own definitions of the target word. And all of this can only be done when we adequately build background knowledge around a word. So the Freyer model is, is done best when it is laid out in the middle of a unit or at the end of a unit. We have to deeply build background knowledge or our English learners and all of our students will, won't have enough background knowledge by which to come up with examples. Um, and so you'll notice the way that examples are defined. So characteristics of the target word. What are some characteristics of the coronavirus? Um, illustrations. Um, examples, right? A system. What systems are associated with the coronavirus? 
that's the, that's what's going to go under the examples quadrant, the first quadrant. The second quadrant, non-examples, when you know a word, you know what it is and you know what it isn't. And so the non-examples box, the way that I like to um, explain it is it's the opposite of one of the examples oftentimes, or it's a word that's closely related to the target word, but not quite the target word. And uh, in a minute, I'm gonna show you an example of all of this. So you're gonna be able to contextualize uh, the strategy. The third uh, quadrant is the visual, right? And oftentimes our students, they are able to recall the visual before the linguistic label. And so the visual becomes really important and making sure that our students can justify their uh their pictures their visuals and then finally right one two three scaffolds and students come up with their own definitions using a sentence frame and so uh examples from the examples box can be used in the definition and students are more likely to retain a definition when they have come up with it themselves instead of looked it up in a dictionary, which tends to be archaic in nature. And at the beginning, I suggested a few minutes ago that it's really important to build and activate uh, background knowledge, right, with, with the Freyer model. I mean, anytime, but especially with a strategy like this. If we put a word up like the coronavirus without students right, having adequate or deep background knowledge of the word, other than their own experiences, then they're really going to struggle with defining the word deeply or coming up with examples. And Fisher and Frey in their article, Building and Activating Background Knowledge, they, uh, they recommend that there are direct ways and indirect ways to build background knowledge. Some direct ways include a lab experiment, a field trip, a hands-on activity, a guest speaker, simulations or tiles or manipulatives in math. Indirect ways, and I'm going to use two, the two highlighted in blue with you today, uh, pre-planned web searches, a series of pictures. Today I'm going to model using a short video clip um, about the coronavirus. And then I'm going to read one page out of a children's book about the coronavirus in order to build background knowledge. And so with that, um, I'd like to move into the, um, the short video that I'd like you to watch. As you are listening to this video, Please think through what I'm gonna ask you uh, for are examples. What examples are you hearing um, about the coronavirus from this particular video? And um, I should frame the video. It is, uh, it's actually, it is uh, by, it's narrated by Donald Sutherland. It's called Rainbows and Windows. And it's a book about big imaginations, big feelings, and sheltering in place during the pandemic. And this is something, right, that's free online that you, uh, you perhaps, when you go back to the classroom, or as you continue, if you're still in the classroom, um, uh, that you might want to use yourself. And so with that, again, we're listening for examples of the coronavirus from this video. Yumi presents Rainbows and Windows, narrated by Oscar winner Donald Sutherland. Amos Brown loves the trees, loves going to school, loves cartwheeling in the breeze. But one morning as he was getting ready to play, his mom said, Amos, I'm sorry, but we have to stay inside today. There's a rotten virus outside making people really sick. Its name is COVID-19, and it's a tough bug to kick. So we have to stay in, wash our hands, and be kind. This won't last forever, but it's on everyone's mind. 
Short walks are okay. We can wave from afar. But for the next little while, we won't go very far. That worried Amos. And filled him with fears. To be stuck without friends brought a cloud full of tears. Sure, he loved being at home, wearing PJs all day. But it wasn't the same without friends who could play. Amos's mom saw that he was a bit down in the dumps. So she hatched a quick plan to get him over these lumps. She pulled out some paints and some fun paper, too, and they built a beautiful rainbow held together with glue. When they were all done, she gave Amos a kiss and said, let's put this in our window where it's impossible to miss. See, staying at home is hard for adults, too. We like being outside, seeing friends just like you do. Rainbows and windows will help everyone feel less blue. So if you're like Amos and you feel stuck at home, let's make rainbows together to feel less alone. And so that's a short, it's about two minute video that you might want to also use, right, in uh, the classroom setting with your students. Um, and so what I'm gonna ask is that we, in the chat box, what are some examples of the coronavirus that you noticed just from, just from that short video clip? Okay, great, and I'm seeing some come in. Okay, I have lost the visual, guys. So if somebody can take over, I have lost for some reason. I can tell you some of the comments that okay. are made. So, there okay, there we go. Did you, do go, you see it? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. For some reason I'm having stay inside is a tough bug, hard to kick. Wave from afar, wash your hands. It's a hard bug to kick, uh, but can still take short walks. Um, test our resilience, takes us away from loved ones. Be patient, gets wonderful. people sick. And those are wonderful. And they would end up, right, many of them in our examples box. And what I typically, thank you, oh, Carmen, for uh, helping me out there. Um, what we typically do is make sure that students can justify why they included those examples in the examples box. And as long as they can justify how those examples are connected to the target word, then it will end up on the poster version of this um, of this Freyer model. And so some of the words that, that came up in the video specifically is that it was a tough bug to kick, it's easily spread, we must socially distance to prevent it, um, and we wash our hands to avoid it. So that was one way that I built background knowledge around the coronavirus. And obviously students have, right, experience with this now as well. They've been living through it. So the other way that I want to build background knowledge around this word is uh, by using this free digital uh, ebook that is available online. You may want to take down the title. It's called Coronavirus, a book for children. And it was written by uh, a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, two teachers, and a child psychologist. So for this piece, I am going to, as I suggested, just share one, um, one page from the text. And I have to Here we go, sorry, for some reason I'm splitting screens here. Um, okay, 
And so with this text, Okay, we'll start here. And uh, it's, it's what, is the, what is the coronavirus? The coronavirus, and as you're listening, remember you're listening for examples that would go in the examples quadrant of the Freyer model. So what is the coronavirus? The coronavirus is a kind of virus. Viruses are tiny germs that are so small that you can't see them. They are so light that they can float through the air in tiny drops of water and they can sit on your skin without you feeling them. If some of those germs get inside of you, they can use your body to make more germs and that will make you ill. And you can see two colleagues here talking to each other. Do I have germs on me now? Yes, but hardly any of them are dangerous. There are different kinds of, there are different sorts of coronaviruses and some of them can infect people. If you have been infected with one of these coronaviruses, all you probably had was a snotty nose or a cough. And you could see, achoo, bless you, could be the coronavirus, but we're not sure. But when this completely new coronavirus germ gets inside a human body, it causes an illness called COVID-19. And when people talk about catching the coronavirus, they're actually talking about this illness. So with that, we learned a few more things, right? We learned some of the characteristics of the coronavirus. Um, we learned a bit about the distinction between the coronavirus and COVID-19 itself. So from that, uh, from that short reading selection, if you would write down in the uh, chat box, what are some additional examples that you noted? And Carmen, if you can help me with that as well as I transition back to the PowerPoint. Sure. Thank you. So viruses are tiny germs that you can't see. Germs get inside you. So in particular, the, the tiny germs, right? That's an yeah. addition that, that wasn't there last time, right? Yeah, another one, they can make more germs and make you ill. Mm -hmm. yes. They float in the air. They float in the air, which is right, droplets, why a mask is so important um, during this time. And so you'll notice what I've done here is I've added in blue are all of the examples that emerged from the video and in black are the examples that emerged from this just a short piece of text that told us a whole lot more about the coronavirus. And you can see that unless we do this work, right, uh, unless we adequately build background knowledge, in this case via the video and the short text, that it's going to be pretty tough to come up with a lot of examples, right? And the power of all of these examples with the Freyer model is that we're te not teaching one word at a time. We're not just teaching the coronavirus. We're teaching all of these words here under the examples box as associated with the target word. When you know what a word is, you know what it is, and you know what it isn't. And so some of the non-examples -exa are that, are uh, the seasonal flu, right? The seasonal flu is closely associated to coronavirus, but not quite it, right? It's not the same. Um, sometimes the non-examples are the opposite of the examples. So an easier bug to kick, this, this particular bug, the coronavirus, is right, really difficult to kick, right? Um, it keeps us at home for less time. When we have a cold or the flu, we typically, right, um, we, we might stay at home one or two days, but certainly, right, not the two weeks that it takes to quarantine. And it's, uh, or, or, right, to, to get over the entire illness, which may take months. And then somewhat, it's somewhat contagious as opposed to the coronavirus is very contagious. So what we would do um, after we come up with the examples and non-examples, notice that I had anticipated, right? I had already written up 
some of the examples and non-examples. And that's really important as teachers that we really think through what are the examples and non-examples that we are going to allow and accept from our students. Um, rem recalling that as long as students can justify how the word is, the example is connected to the target word, then I usually accept it as the teacher. And the third then uh, quadrant in the Freyer model is a visual. And you'll notice that I, I got, I took this from the internet, right? And it's a visual of the coronavirus, the Right. Um, and so students would then say and talk through how that visual represents the coronavirus. And finally, the last step, which I'm going to have you actually uh, talk through or, or write in the in the chat box, is that we would come up with our own definition of the word. So we have one, two, three scaffolds before we're asking students to come up with their own definition of the word. And so uh, here's a potential, here's my definition, and I didn't use the frame, so you can have students use the frame, right? And, and typically the first time around, I might have them use the frame because notice that the frame here lends itself to use the examples in the definition itself. But here's my definition, and then I'm gonna ask you, I'll put the frame in the chat box and have you share your, um, your definitions. The coronavirus is a type of virus with germs so small that you can't see them. The virus is easily spread through droplets, causing us to have to socially distance and wear masks. And you'll notice I used a type of virus with germs so small you can't see them, right? That was from our building background knowledge stage. The droplets was from, right, the text causing us to socially distance and wear masks, that's something, right, from my background knowledge, my prior knowledge, rather, that I was able to add to my definition. And so with that, what I'd like you to do is, in the chat box, I'm gonna put in the frame and have you, uh, have a couple of you share out, or most of you, whomever wants to, um, to share out your final definitions, right? So the coronavirus is blank, blank, and blank because, and I can put back up the, I'll put the, the slide with all of the examples up to support your definitions as well. And Carmen, as you see some, if you can read them. Sure. The coronavirus is very contagious, potentially deadly, and so we need to wear masks and social distance. Oh, Linda, and I know Linda. <laughs> She's an old East Bay colleague. Thank you for being here. Yes, yeah, so contagious. So I see, right, uh, that was in our, was that in our box? It was, it, it's something, right, that from your background knowledge, it's potentially deadly. Mm -hmm. um, we need to wear masks and socially distance, right? And so some of those examples came from the examples box. Participants can, or students can um, choose to use the examples and the characteristics or uh, use the frame or come outside of the frame. The coronavirus- Here are a couple more, uh, Ivania. Okay. Uh, the coronavirus is a tough germ that uses your own body to make you ill. It attacks the lungs and the blood and makes recovery very challenging for some people. Mm, so I like, right? So a bit more specificity there, right? With what we've been seeing in the news, right? And reading about, uh, right? That, that it particularly attacks the lungs, the blood, and very challenging for some people, in particular, right, anybody with underlying um, conditions or in particular age groups. It's and we have a few more. The coronavirus is a kind of virus contagious and easily spread because it, because it floats in the air. 
Wonderful. And then another one, the coronavirus is small, easily spread, and very contagious. We must socially distance to stay healthy and not get ill. Wonderful. So one of the things that we can do, thank you all for, for participating. One of the things we can do with this final definition box is we can split it in half and we can have the student's personal definition and then the class definition. So one thing we might want to do is take some of uh, Janet's right, definition and some of Katie Arriaga's, who I also know, hello, um, uh, right? We can put those two definitions together to have a class definition, right? Um, and, and because this is done midway through or at the end of a lesson, then we can constantly refine right the examples the non-examples we can refine the the class definition um and so having this so in a, in a classroom setting have a big having a big poster version of your frayer models is really powerful right because it becomes something that that we can shape and revise um and that is a living document if you will and so because of that, what I'd like to do is to then um, to, to end by going over exactly what we did during this lesson. So let's, let's take a moment to reflect upon what are some tips, right? What, what were the steps that, that were utilized uh, during this presentation? So the first piece is that we would intentionally select five to seven tier two or tier three words per unit. Not every word is a Freyer model word, in other words. So we would use all those other right, academic vocabulary strategies that you all listed at the beginning of this presentation for other words. But here with the Freyer model, Freyer model, we want to use larger concept words, right? We want to build background knowledge first. We want to make sure that students have adequate uh, background knowledge around the word so that they're able to come up with those examples, right? To come up with that final definition. As I suggested before, the strategy is best used in the middle or at the end of the unit. I just suggested the larger concept, thematic in nature. Teachers should facilitate conversations around each quadrant. So every time that I had you go into the chat box, those are opportunities that I would have had face to face. I would have students come to consensus and talk to each other to come up with additional examples or non-examples. I also have students share their visuals and justify them to explain them to each other. And then I typically have my students come to consensus around the definition. So it's not an individual definition, it's a pair definition, right? So we know the role of academic oral language is essential. Our English learners aren't speaking enough in the classroom setting. So even though this is a vocabulary development strategy, we want them to talk throughout the process. The Freer model is not an independent worksheet. Right? I was leading you and guiding you through each of the steps, right? Um, and having you stop and use the chat box. And we were looking at your, right, what you came up with. So, um, and the final step is that teachers should pre plan and anticipate student responses. Sometimes, if we don't do this, you'll notice I already had some examples from the video, right, laid out in the second, right, each uh, in the slide after you all shared. I, I pre-planned and anticipated what you might say, right? That doesn't mean that those are, those are the only examples that I'm going to utilize. It merely means that I have thought through the process, each of the stages, okay? And have been explicit about that. And so uh, with that, I just, uh, I'd like to, to end by just sharing that if you want to know more about this, this is actually outlined in the book, ELL Shadowing as a Catalyst for Change. Uh, this is one of the strategies that I outline explicitly uh, in the book. So if you'd like to know more about it, um, Corwin 
uh, press is actually giving a 25% discount to any books, um, not just shadowing. And then we will also um, we will also be providing the PowerPoint to you all and the graphic organizer will be posting that in, in a few days. And so with that, uh, I think it goes back to Carmen and thank you all for your, for your participation. Thank you, Ivania, for sharing your expertise and support of all educators and families. This was outstanding. It has been a powerful addition to our teacher strategies for distance learning webinar series. And thank you to all of our participants for joining our webinar. And on behalf of CAVE Board of Directors and the full CAVE team, we hope you have found these strategies valuable to your work with students. Check out our CAVE Facebook for more information on our upcoming webinars and visit our CAVE page at www.gocave.org to find the recording of this session and the handouts. All materials will be posted by tomorrow. So please stay safe, be well, and know that we're all in this together. We are Cabe Strong. Thank you and hasta la próxima. Bye bye. Are we seeing?